Uh, we are excited to have you here with us today for our webinar on understanding timing and planning aspects of pavement projects. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items for you here this morning. Um, you will be muted, uh, but if you have any questions throughout the presentation today, please do include those questions in the Zoom chat. Uh, we'll do our best to reply to all of them. Um, and if by chance we don't get to respond to your question, we will make sure that we follow up with you in the next couple of days following the webinar. Okay, so we're gonna kick things off with just sharing a little bit about Benchmark. Uh, I know there's a few people that are newer uh, to Benchmark. Uh, so Benchmark is a roof and pavement consulting company. We were established in 1983. We have two offices, one in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and one in Waukesha, Wisconsin, and we also have about 20 satellite locations with uh, team members who work throughout the United States. Um, we are independent, privately owned corporation, and the services that we offer are evaluation, design and bid services, construction phase services, or you may also know of, uh, know of them as called project management services, uh, program management for helping uh, people manage fleets of um, pavements and roofs, and then we also do our own in-house UAV imagery. So at Benchmark, we live um, by our core values and Benchmark's three core values are to be a strong team based on relationships and trust, be really committed to being technically excellent and to be a benchmark. Our core focus every day is to develop strong relationships and deliver proven results, especially to all of our customers. And our promise is to keep your best interest in mind. So at all times when we're working with our customers, our promise is that we will keep your best interest in mind. So uh, your presenters today are Troy Kaiser. Troy is uh, a senior consultant with Benchmark and uh, he's been in the pavement industry since 1984 uh, and he joined Benchmark in 2006. Uh, Troy is involved in various client programs, and he's instrumental in our design and rehabilitation phase um, of many pavements for our customers. Uh, so we're excited to have Troy here with us today. Uh, and I am Elise Schmidt. I am the operations manager and one of our pavement account managers. Uh, and um, I've been with Benchmark since 2004. And um, one of my specialties is working with some of our national clients to help them develop pavement management programs. So uh, we look forward to uh, sharing some content with you today and answering any questions that you have um, and helping you to manage your uh, pavements. So let's touch on our key objectives for today. So our key objectives today are really to um, the purpose of aligning your budget cycles with your fiscal or your calendar year and, and how that plays into your spending requirements. We're also gonna talk about why inventorying pavements is critical in the prioritization and budgeting phase. Uh, we're also gonna talk about some cost saving strategies based on pavement condition and things you want to consider based on uh, the condition of where your pavement is at. Uh, we're going to touch on benefits of proactive design and bidding and all of the different aspects that play into that phase of a project. And then we're also going to touch today on why vetting uh, contractors and suppliers is critical to uh, each and every project. And then um, we're also going to share some planning considerations, including your local construction seasons uh, throughout the United States uh, and navigating the local permitting process. Uh, so let's jump right in. Uh, so some key milestones that we wanted to touch on as it relates to the pl planning phase is um, the baseline assessment slash evaluation process ideally should be happening eight to 12 months before your budgeting cycle. So you might be on a regular calendar cycle or you may actually be on a uh, fiscal year cycle, uh, but really you should be doing any assessments or inventorying of your pavement assets now for your 2025 and 26 pavement installation projects. Uh, then the design and bidding efforts, um, that's usually about, we would recommend that happen six to 12 months before installation. Certainly there are times we're working with a customer right now who got funding available in early June and they're looking to build their project in Pennsylvania before the end of the year. Uh, so certainly there are times that the, um, the window is shorter, but what we're really sharing with you is key milestones and ideal timing and planning today to help set you, the contractors, and your projects and facilities up for success. 
Uh, one thing you're going to hear us note a couple of times throughout the day is that if it, if there are local permits required for a project, that will allow addition. You need to allow additional time. And so there are times that permitting may take one day. There's times it could take six months or more. And uh, Troy will talk about that a little bit more, but it really comes down to the complexity of your project um, and the local permitting requirements. Okay, so are you planning a 2025 pavement project? So hopefully you're sitting there in the audience and you're thinking, yeah, I've got one project, I've got 10 projects, maybe you've got three projects. Um, and so if you are planning a 2025 pavement project, we wanted to lay out um, what would be an ideal scenario, um, noting that the timeline is about 50% reduced from what Benchmark really feels is an ideal scenario if you start right now. So if you have a 2025 pavement project and you haven't started any of the planning phase, uh, you may be a little bit behind schedule. Um, but that's okay. We can help you catch up to schedule. Um, so that ideal time frame kind of looks like if you have a project in 2025, you should start that planning now. So in Q4 of 2024, you want to be taking care of any pavement inventorying that might need to be done. Maybe that's already been done. Um, and then in Q1, you would really be putting together your budgets and priorities, whether it's for a single site or portfolio wide. Uh, that would give you Q2 of 2025 to go through the design development phase, which includes geotech, any field data collection work, uh, vetting of your stakeholders, making sure vetting of your contractors and suppliers, uh, getting stakeholder input and bidding. Uh, and then that would allow you to really be prepared to build that project, award the project, and move into construction in Q3 and Q4. As I said before, you can certainly condense that time frame. Uh, but this is what we would be looking at for kind of an ideal if you start now. One of the things we would consider you to think about is the timeline to project execution realistic. And so uh, a couple of the things we want you to think about today and we're going to touch on are um, why design and bid so far in advance helps in the process. So it allows for ample time for design, which reduces the risk for change orders and unknowns. It allows you to secure competitive bids. Um, you know, something that a lot of our clients aren't aware of is that many paving contractors' current backlog is six to nine months. Uh, so most contractors today would rather be bidding on a 2025 project than submitting a bid today for a rush 2024 project. So we really want to emphasize the importance of planning ahead. Um, both to allow you to secure competitive pricing, but also to make sure you get the number of bids that you need to get. Um, and then bidding late in the year um, also can drive up that contractor uh, pricing and it allows for a much shorter construction window and less scheduling flexibility. So um, then we wanted to share with you a time frame for um, the ideal scenario if you manage more than one pavement and you have a pavement program that you're planning. Um, so this is kind of the ideal scenario. So if you're starting today, Q4 and Q1, Q4 of this year, Q1 of next year is when you should really be targeting your pavement inventory. Uh, then that allows you in Q2 to prioritize budgets and um, any priorities. It allows you to start that design in um, Q3 of 2025. Again, that design development includes the geotechnical field work, vetting of proper materials and contractors, and also obtaining stakeholder input. Then you would be bidding your projects between Q3 and Q4 of 2025, and essentially be ready to go in Q1 of 2026. Uh, one of the best ways to get the most competitive pricing and to ensure that you're not having late season paving is to be one of the first projects out of the gate for those contractors. And so best way to do that is if possible, if your budgeting cycle allows, is to get your projects designed the calendar year before you're looking to build them. That allows you to get things closed out in Q3 before the end of the year. Uh, we've worked with many clients who are literally obtaining their final invoices on that last day of the year just to make sure that they meet that time frame. Um, and we will touch on this ideal um, paving program scenario again uh, in our recap. So uh, what are some realistic timeframes that you can expect? So the evaluation and assessment phase is usually about 45 to 60 days if you're working with an external uh, partner to complete that for you. The design and bid documents is about a 60 to 75 day phase. And that does, that 60 to 75 days does include uh, an allowance for um, the geotech. Geotech is usually about 30 days, about two weeks for the geotech company to mobilize to the site and another two weeks to get the report back. 
Um, we talked about permits, that time varies. The bid process, usually about three weeks minimum. And during that bid process is when you would be answering any contractor questions and um, also doing pre-bid meeting. Uh, then about 30 days or one month for the bid review and award. So uh, making sure that the bids came in within your budget. If they didn't, how are you gonna scale back the scope of work to meet your budget? Uh, then proceed to award. And then pre-construction activities, we listed 60 days. Uh, there are times you can be ready to go with a construction project in about 30 days, uh, but we would never um, suggest you pushing it any um, shorter time frame than 30 days because the, the contractor needs ample time to make sure that they have the crews available, uh, that they can schedule any subcontractors and that you've had a pre-construction meeting and also that you've taken the necessary time um, for the submittal review process. We're gonna jump into the information gathering and uh, the pavement inventory. Thanks, Elise. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you about um, the eval or inventory of your pavements. Uh, this is the first step in planning uh, your pavement projects. Um, this can be an inventory of a single site or an inventory of multiple sites. Uh, what it, what I call it is boots on the ground. Get out there, walk the site. Uh, we like to take a set of plans with us that uh, we have drawn up ahead of time based on Google images and such. Uh, and just take notes. And we look for defects in the pavements. Uh, possible cause of those payments. We mark those defects on the plan. Uh, that's helpful uh, for the, uh, when the design process comes, it helps us to um, uh, not miss those in the next inspection. Um, we break the, the pavements down into different sections based on pavement type. Is it asphalt or is it concrete? The usage is a roadway, a parking lot, a truck dock, et cetera. Uh, and then we rate the pavement using uh, the PACER system, which was developed uh, by the University of Wisconsin in conjunction with the state of Wisconsin. Um, and it rates the pavements from one to five, um, um, and from excellent to failing. Uh, and so we also look at your curb and gutters. We also look at sidewalks that are adjacent in many cases. The sidewalks are considered a pavement and some of our clients include those in the pavement assessment. Um, and then when we're done uh, surveying the site or sites, we meet with the owners at that site or the um, facility managers, ask them what the usages of, our, the, pay, of the payments are, uh, any concerns they have, um, find out kind of what their priorities are and see if they fall into line with what uh, we find in our investigation. We also note the type of traffic we see. Uh, I've been on sites where it's a car parking lot, but they're parking trailers uh, or semis in there, or the garbage truck might run in there to dump uh, an empty dumpster and then switch out the loaded dumpster. Um, so it's that kind of things we're looking for while we're on the site of the project. We also look for safety issues. Um, if we see anything that's a, a safety issue right away, we, that needs to be repaired right away, we'll mention that in our interview, our exit interview with the facility manager or owner so that they can get those taken care of right away so it's not a liability. Um, the next th thing is uh, what's the benefit of that, of doing these pavement assessments? Well, it helps you mainly prioritize your pavements, which ones are in the best condition, which ones are in uh, fair condition, which ones are in worse condition. Um, it, and then with using that, we can maximize the service life of our pavement assets. It reduces risks by eliminating any of those safety issues. And uh, it helps us put together a plan for how we're going to attack uh, the reconstruction and the maintaining of these pavements. Troy, one of the things we like to say here is, um, or ask our clients is, are you investing, when it comes to investing in your pavements, are you investing the right dollars the right way at the right time? Uh, to ensure that they are preserving their pavement assets. Right, that's a critical point, Elise. It, if you're spending money on things that um, aren't cost effective or shouldn't be done on your pavement, but you, you just don't know if they are cost effective at the time, it's just a waste of money. So right method, right time is, is critical. Um, as part of the uh, evaluation, sometimes we do geotechnical investigation during that phase. Sometimes it's, it's done later during the design phase. 
uh, what is geotechnical investigation? Basically what it is, is a crew comes on site with a rig that can do borings. They bore through the pavement and into the lower uh, stone base and into the um, um, subgrade layers, the dirt or the clay that's underneath there. They're generally three feet deep. And what those borings tell us is the depth of the existing pavement, either the asphalt or the concrete, the depth of the existing stone. And then also tells us the type of material that's underneath the stone. And it also indicates if there's moisture in that material. Uh, the geotechnical crew will then take a sample of that subgrade material and they'll take it back to the laboratory and it'll be tested at the laboratory there. And then the geotechnical company will put together a, a comprehensive report of this for the site. Uh, and it tells us all this information and helps us as it's a very good guide for designing our pavements. But also if we do it during the evaluation phase, it helps us when we put budgets together during that phase for those budgets to be more accurate. Otherwise we're just going on strictly the conditions of the pavements visually and not from this geotechnical data. So it's a really critical part of this whole process. Okay, so now we've done our evaluation and what do we do with that information? Well, we have a philosophy here at uh, Benchmark that we take care of our best pavements first. We're not firemen. We don't want our clients to be firemen. We're always taking care of the problem pavements or the pavements that maybe people are complaining about. So there's three phases of design. There's design for maintenance, preventive maintenance, keeping making sure your good pavements stay in good condition. Next would be, the next priority for us would be the overlays, doing overlays which are less expensive than reconstruction and can save a pavement and extend its life. And then the last phase that we concentrate are on the pavements that need reconstruction, because once a pavement reaches the point that it needs reconstruction, as long as it's not a safety issue, um, that pavement's not gonna get any worse or not gonna cost any more if we delay it one or two years while we get the good pavements protected and the overlays done. Um, and there's a reason behind this and it's right here in uh, this chart. Um, what this shows is the, um, the condition of your pavements from top to bottom, excellent to poor. And then the years across the bottom as you move from left to right. And then the dotted line is the deterioration curve of a, a new pavement from when it's paved to uh, when it fails. And as you can see, you'll start out in the first year with a brand new pavement and it starts to deteriorate. And then in the fourth or fifth year, it's you wanna do your maintenance, your preventive maintenance. And then that improves the pavement a little bit and protects it so that it, now that deterior, deterioration curve has um, uh, moved up. So then it continues to deteriorate down in, you know, in the next five years, it's maybe in the good can, still in a good condition. So you do another preventive maintenance cycle, improves the pavement condition. And then over the next five years, it deteriorates to the point where maybe preventive maintenance isn't cost effective. Uh, if you remember, we talked about right method at the right time. Well, if pavement that has too many cracks, it might not be cost effective to crack fill it. So at that time, we're looking at an overlay. So we do what we call a structural overlay, not just a a simple throw an inch of asphalt over the top, a, a well-designed overlay with maybe some drainage improvements and some patching before that. And now we've returned that pavement to its excellent condition. Then we continue our um, preventative maintenance cycles. And now we've extended the life of that pavement 16 years. And in this scenario, we went with a million dollar pavement. Uh, now this could be one parking lot. We certainly have clients that have um, million dollar pavement sections, or it could be, uh, like Elise said, a whole fleet of pavements over several sites. By doing this preventative maintenance cycle and then overlaying, our costs are generally about 32000 a year over the lifetime of that pavement. Now in the next scenario, let's say we you do it in an evaluation of your pavement and some of your pavements are in that fair condition. They're beyond preventative maintenance, but they don't need re full reconstruction yet. So we've already spent the money preserving our pavements that are in good to excellent condition. So now we can do an overlay 
in that you know 10 to 12 year period. Now we've improved that pavement to an excellent condition. And now you can start your preventive maintenance cycle then and do your, uh, re your preventive maintenance every four or every eight to 10 years, I'm sorry, every five to 10 years uh, cycles. Now if you extended it 10 years um, and still your maintenance costs for a million dollar pavement are only $60,000 uh, per year. But as you can see, by doing preventive maintenance right away, when you first build that pavement, um, you save quite a bit. And then the last scenario is we're going to take that million dollar pavement and from new and we're going to run it to failure. We don't do any maintenance to it. Uh, we kind of ignore that pavement until it becomes a fire that needs to be put out. So in that, you know, uh, 12 to 15 year period, we rebuild that pavement or reconstruct it. And, uh, and then we let it run to failure again. You know, we might it now we've gained 12 years after we reconstruct it. The maintenance cost over that same time period becomes 83, roughly thousand dollars per year. So as you can see, by doing that preventative maintenance every three to five years, doing the uh, overlay uh, at the right time, uh, it's way more cost effective. Uh, it'll save you money in the long run and it will improve your pavement portfolio overall. Uh, um, instead of just always reconstructing your bad pavements. Um, just, I want to bring up, we have a design philosophy also where we try to build perpetual pavements for our clients. And what that is, is we build up during the reconstruction or the new phase of construction, we make sure we have a solid base. We have good drainage to make sure that that base doesn't become soft. And we build a pavement that is robust and thick enough for the traffic that it's going to receive either cars or trucks, forklifts, and in the case of an asphalt pavement, we can, when it comes time to do that overlay, all we have to do is remove a little bit of pavement at that time. And then every time that pavement gets to the overlay phase, you just keep replacing the surface and what's underneath that is considered, considered perpetual. Where if you just build on top of what's there without doing those kind of improvements or making sure that base is solid, you may not be able to do an overlay. So um, I just wanted to bring up that perpetual pavement idea uh, which can also be um, applied to concrete pavements. Um, if we make sure the, the base is solid, has good drainage, um, obviously that concrete can't be re resurfaced, but it will last you know, 20, 30 years if we have that proper base. So I consider that a perpetual pavement as well. Thank you, Troy. So Troy talked about um, some of the considerations for design prioritization when, as it, when it comes to the condition of the pavement building off of that assessment phase. Um, also, when you're looking at um, the considerations for design prioritization, you wanna be thinking about operations and safety. So this is really things that apply to your individual facility, uh, to your company. Uh, some of the um, things that fall in this category are facility feedback is key um, to understand operational concerns and needs at the facility. It's also critical during the design phase when you're looking at prioritizing your design projects and where you're going to spend your capital funding to know if there's other facility projects or initiatives that are going to impact that project. One of the clients that we work with, uh, they, they design their projects about nine months prior to construction, and they're looking out over a three-year window. They've got a good idea of what capital projects are coming up, and if they're do, going to be doing a building expansion, well, then maybe it doesn't make sense for us to, to do the truck marshalling lot right now because it's adjacent to that building expansion. And so you want to make sure that you're really thinking about, especially when you're managing a fleet of pavements, you want to understand what other facility projects and initiatives um, maybe will impact the ultimate outcome of that project. You also want to look at facility, the season, the peak season, and if there's any facility shutdowns. Great time to work is if there is facility shutdowns. Sometimes we need to avoid peak season or we need to phase accordingly around peak season to ensure that the operations can keep moving during a pavement project. Uh, another thing to look at or consideration is bottlenecks in traffic or pe um, pedestrian flow. So when you're gonna be doing a rehabilitation project, you wanna make sure you've identified any of those potential uh, issues, as well as is there any damage occurring to your vehicles, to your trailers, to your trucks, uh, maybe there's potholes, pounding water, et cetera. So you want to make sure that you work those areas into the design. And then lastly, you really want to look at the safety concerns, both for your employees, your customers, um, as well as any visitors, and take into account uh, ADA as well. 
So we've talked about the uh, inventory phase or the assessment phase, and then we've also talked about some of the designed considerations. So one of the things we also wanted to uh, touch on today is prioritizing for a portfolio. So I think over half of you said you have multiple or more than half of you have multiple sites that you're prioritizing. And this is just a snip of a mock-up. Uh, there would certainly be more information on this if this was a real life example, uh, but this shows multiple facilities here and you can see that facility number one, they're, they're, um, pay, they have three different sections in this list that need to be rehabbed, uh, but they're not all in the same priority, right? So we will oftentimes work with our clients to rank things on a priority by facility and then we take that information and rank it on a priority by company. And this really allows you, um, and, and with one of our clients that we work with, uh, each year they'll come to us and say, I've got, you know, let's say $6 million to spend this year. Where is the best place for me to spend that $6 million? They may have $14 million worth of um, projects that have been designed and or $14 million worth of recommendations from the inventory, but they just can't fund all of that. And so we help them to kind of draw that line. And so one of the things is looking at uh, what are those critical areas um, that are gonna be impacted and uh, making sure that you're prioritizing amongst multiple facilities. We've worked with clients before who say like, oh, I've never even done a project here. I never hear from this facility, but XYZ facility is always calling me. So they're getting our money. Um, and so looking at it from a comprehensive portfolio prioritization perspective is one of the keys to planning a successful pavement project. And then really understanding, you also wanna look at the regions where these projects are taking place also, because uh, you don't want all of your projects to be on the East Coast. If you've got a portfolio throughout the United States, you wanna phase your projects accordingly where you can be spending that money wisely um, throughout your calendar or fiscal year. All right, so let's touch on the benefits of proactive design and bid development. The biggest benefit when it comes to being proactive in the design and the bid development phase is time. And um, we have it underlined with an exclamation point uh, because time is critical to ensuring so many different aspects of this process. And Troy's gonna jump into these in detail, but I just wanted to share at a high level with you what some of the uh, time aspects are. So you wanna make sure you have ample time uh, for gathering the uh, field information, inventorying the pavement, getting the geotech work done, you want to make sure you have ample time for assessing the permitting requirements prior to the design of the project. You don't want to be bitten that there's um, permitting requirements that you weren't aware of. Uh, ample time for input from key stakeholders on priority areas and how to phase construction. Uh, you also want to make sure that you have time for contractors to, prov to provide their bids. Uh, when contractors feel rushed or um, they feel like they can't meet an aggressive schedule, they'll just decline to bid the project. And many of the clients that we work with require a minimum of three bids. And so you want to make sure that you allow ample time for that bidding and that you're not backing into um, a holiday season or backing into end of the year uh, when they're trying to wrap up the current year. Um, time also plays a factor with design priorities um, to make sure that they're clearly defined and established prior to design allows you to get competitive bids, and it also allows for um, more potential for scheduling flexibility. So um, Troy's going to jump into each of these components here for us. Okay, so what, what, why do we need this time? For, well, in the design process, uh, we need time to get back out to the site once the client has um, prioritized what sites they want to do for the next season or next fiscal year. So we need to get out there and do a more detailed inspection of the that particular part of a site or multiple sites for the client. Uh, that includes sometimes having to shoot a lot of grades or hire a company to come in and do a complete site survey because of the design will be that extensive. Uh, so that, that takes a lot of time. We need to get that done. If the geotech wasn't done during the evaluation phase, now that adds additional time because that that, that uh, information is critical for a proper design. Uh, we have to take the time to vet what, what materials are in the area. It doesn't do any good for us to specify a material. If it has to be trucked from so far away, it won't be cost effective, or maybe it's not even available in that area. And then some of the methods that are used in that area uh, need to be investigated. Uh, we also It also takes time, or it's nice to have time to look at different options for an area. We can run different scenarios. Would asphalt be more cost-effective or 
the same amount of concrete, would it be less expensive and we'd still get the same strength? So when we have that time to do that analysis, we end up with much better bit, uh, plans and specifications, a much better design, and uh, it really allows uh, us to serve the customer better when we have that time to do that. Also part of that time during the design phase and developing the bidding documents is uh, how's the project gonna be built? Phasing is sometimes very critical, especially in very busy sites, especially uh, loading dock areas or um, say uh, employee parking lots or uh, customer parking lots. They need to be phased uh, in a way that will keep the business open because uh, that's number one. Uh, those operations need to be uh, uh, not impacted by construction or impacted as little as possible. But also we want to give the contractors large enough areas to work so we can get better pricing. The more we break up a project, the higher the cost is going to be because of mobilization, lost production by the contractor. So if we have enough time, that allows us to meet with all the stakeholders, which includes uh, production, re uh, receiving and shipping, security, uh, the trucking and logistics division, and leadership sometimes gets involved and have meetings to talk about these and really plan how the construction is going to go. Um, I can remember one particular project. It was a large manufacturing facility and uh, racked my brain for at least a week trying to figure out how it was going to give the contractor enough loading docks to work with. And we sat down and had a meeting at the site. And one of the production managers, um, she spoke up and said, well, you know what? We can bring all the materials in by rail. And it solved all our problems. So we were able to do the receiving docks all at one time. We got much better pricing. The project went faster, so we had less disruption at the site. Just because the right person was in that meeting and kind of thinking out of the box where uh, some of the other officials I had talked to at that site had never thought of using the rail system. So it's good to involve people who, um, all the people involved because you get a lot of different opinions and sometimes we get locked into doing things a certain way and it's always good to, to learn new things. Also, um, just another example is this particular site that you can see here on our slide. This was a, a very large distribution center it had dry goods and a refrigerated section. And so it was like almost working two jobs at the same time. So you'd have phase one might be two different areas, but it still allowed the contractor to do um, much more work than if we had only done one little phase and worked around the facility. Um, and then the trucking uh, entrance exit had to be reconstructed as well. Well, how can we do that and keep traffic flow coming in out? This is, was a very busy site. And uh, what we came up with, we were lucky. There were two entrances to this site. One was not being used, but we were able to make it one-way traffic moving uh, counterclockwise around the site. So that allowed us to work on one half of the, the main truck entrance exit uh, while the trucks were only moving in one direction and then switch them over to the other half once we completed it. And you know, it's those kinds of details that if you have the time to analyze and figure them out, uh, it's just critical that this stuff gets done with plenty of time before the project starts. Uh, at least touched on permitting. Permitting can be as easy as you go down to the, the local municipality and pay for your permit. All they're looking for is the dollars. But sometimes it can get very complicated. Sometimes they'll look at, especially if it's like drainage, if it's a, a new parking lot where you have a stormwater plan, stormwater drainage, um, ADA requirements. They'll often want to make sure those are up to date and they'll check that. A lot of uh, municipalities require a certain amount of green space. Um, and so sometimes this can become very complicated. I can remember one project that Elise and I worked on. It took months to get it through the city and we had to actually hire a company that that's their whole business was helping contractors get through the permitting process at the city. So that's how convoluted it was. But uh, just plan on, uh, you know, people often forget about it. We get the whole design done, we bid it, all of a sudden we're getting ready to go to construction and all of a sudden this pops up. And uh, a lot of times it requires redoing plans and specs, having them go back again for approval a couple of times before you get the final approval. So just be aware that it can delay your project. Uh, qualified and vetting contractors. 
obviously the more contractors you get to bid your project, the better competitive bidding you're going to have. But we only want quality pro contractors that can actually do the type of work that we're uh, specifying. So um, we use pre-qualification forms. We look at their websites. We check to see if they're a, a concrete or asphalt supplier or, a, or just a, a, the contractor. They don't make their own materials. Um, local contractors, I've always felt are best because they're there watching the project. But in the past few years, we found some companies that are willing to travel and are more regional that do a really good job. And because of the uh, experiences we've had with them, we've started inviting them to bid projects that might not be in their hometown, but they certainly will uh, bring their own fleets of equipment and, and contractors and subcontractors that they're comfortable with and that we're comfortable with. And we invite them to bid projects as well. So that, you know, that takes time to locate all these people and make sure um, they're qualified to uh, bid these projects. Uh, I talked about competitive bidding. Um, competitive bidding, we, we want as many contractors as possible, but let's do that bidding when they're not busy. So the best time to bid projects is uh, over the winter time, early spring, when they're not busy, they have time to look at the bids. Um, they're trying to fill up their workload for the following summer, so they're hungry. Um, we want to make sure we give them detailed plans and specs. And if we give them, uh, we like to bid things with unit prices so they don't have to do takeoffs and do a lot of um, calculations for their bid. They know it's going to be so many square yards of asphalt, so many square yards of stone, so many tons of certain materials, so many cubic yards of concrete. They don't have to do all that work to put the bids together. So it's, it's simple for them to actually think of what's a better way to do this project? Can I find a closer dump site? Um, instead of milling it, is it quicker and more cost effective for me to use a, a front end loader or, uh, or an excavator? So, um, you know, we want to give the contractors time to put together good bids and co more competitive bids. And that's, again, where that time factor comes in. We need to give them, you know, I think Elise said three weeks. And three weeks is, is a good time frame for them to look at things when they're not busy. So in the fall and early spring. Uh, bidding early and having your all your ducks in a row early uh, um, also allows for uh, scheduling flexibility. Uh, we can actually put right in the bid documents when we want the work done so the contractor knows up front if they are awarded, they can lock that project in and that locks it in for you for maybe a plant shutdown period or during a holiday break or, or, or your slow season but also allows us to make sure that our projects aren't being done at, you know, in the case of Southern states at the very heat of the summer, it's not always the best time to be putting asphalt or concrete down. Uh, the asphalt doesn't cool very quickly. Uh, the concrete actually cures faster and it's harder for the crew to get the finishing done quick uh, in time. Uh, and we definitely don't want to run late in the year in the Northern climates where, you know, they, they shut down. Uh, if, if you if you don't get your project done before the asphalt plants shut down, that you're done. They aren't going to open for you. If they do open, it's going to be at a very expensive surcharge because they can't get electricity. They have to get a portable generator on the plant. And then uh, placing asphalt in cold weather, asphalt is dependent, compaction is dependent on temperature. And if the asphalt cools off before you get it compacted, you're going to get an inferior product. Uh, in the case of concrete, you can pour concrete in cold weather, but you're going to have to cover it uh, with um, insulation blankets, which is going to drive up the costs and maybe result in the contractor asking for extras if the project runs long because we didn't have all our ducks in a row. Um, other things to consider uh, for weather, if you have a kind of a rainy season and you're aware that it, you know it's better to do uh, your projects when it's not so wet so that the schedule can stay on track, uh, that's, that's another uh, important reason to have uh, everything done in a timely manner. So definitely uh, lots of different time considerations when it comes to the design phase of a project. Uh, so we are going to recap here and then we're going to uh, jump into some questions that you have. But just to kind of recap, um, you know, there definitely is benefit in aligning your spending needs with your fiscal year, your calendar year. Uh, this is really the key to building out a program for those of you who have a fleet of pavements, more than one pavement to manage. Uh, this is really key, just making sure that you're inventorying the pavements, you understand the prioritization and the budgeting aspect of it and can and can align your spending uh, with your fiscal and calendar years. 
Um, you know, Troy talked about today the cost saving strategies between uh, based on pavement conditions. So when is the right time looking at an overlay? So that really comes into, um, you know, this webinar was understanding the timing and planning. You want to plan those overlays at the right time where they're not going to cost you three to five times more when they get to reconstruction. Uh, when is the right time that reconstruction might be necessary and what are some of the cost saving strategies uh, during reconstruction? Um, and then Troy also talked about the concept of perpetual pavement and building it right um, from the bottom up so that you can come in and mill off that, um, that top layer and repave it. Um, all of those kind of play into the overall planning. Uh, we talked about all of the time benefits to proactive design and bidding and why upfront vetting of the suppliers and contractors is important. You need to know the type of material um, that's available in your region or your area uh, before putting together those design documents. Um, and ultimately, you know, getting into the right timeline for your single project or your program will really allow you and your individual facility teams the necessary time to plan and execute your projects efficiently, cost effectively, um, and with a great uh, level of success. Um, so I did mention earlier that uh, we were going to share this ideal scenario for a pavement uh, program planning with you again here uh, towards the end. So just as a reminder here, um, you know, this, this, this is kind of the ideal scenario for somebody that's building out a pavement management program. Um, so you want to be doing your um, pavement inventory usually within um, one to three quarter period. So in this case, we've got Q4 of this year into Q1 of next year. Uh, you're aligning your budgets and your priorities both site-wide and portfolio-wide in Q2 of 2025. That allows you in Q3 to undergo all everything that's part of that design development and design considerations that Troy talked about today, geotech, field work, permitting, um, talking to stakeholders, vetting with contractors and suppliers, uh, bidding everything out in Q4. Uh, and, and again, you let the contractors know at that time that we're asking you to bid this project, not for construction yet this year, but this is a 2026 project. Um, and so you're very upfront in the bid documents with that. One thing we didn't touch on today is uh, one of the ways that contractors feel confident in bidding um, the prior calendar year um, is that we work in the bituminous price index specifically for asphalt projects. So if there is a fluctuation in the asphalt pricing, um, we identify what the pricing is um, at the time of bid. And then we look at what the pricing is based on the local DOT websites at the time of award and allow a small contract adjustment. In many cases, it's actually resulted in pricing for asphalt can be higher in Q4 when you're bidding it than Q1 or Q2 when you're awarding it. And so sometimes there's an additional cost savings to um, our clients as well. Um, so then you'd be, you'd be contracting the project, working through the submittal review process in Q1 of 2026 building your projects between Q1 and Q3, and then working on closing that out. And again, this is an ideal scenario for more of a program type approach, which is allowing you to get ahead on managing your pavement assets. Um, so with that, that concludes the, sem the presentation today. Uh, we are gonna check the Q&A here. Um, hey, Elise, so, I wanna, yes. I, I just wanted to add that, it, like you said, it, that's, uh, that timeline is the the benchmark, the idea, <laughs> for lack of yeah. a better word, the ideal. Um, don't feel that if you've got a short timeline, you can't get a project done. Just realize that some of the challenges you're up against, we've certainly turned projects around very quickly. They've had their challenges, They, uh, but we've always made the best of them. Uh, so don't be just, I don't want to make sure we're not discouraging people. If they get all of a sudden a windfall of you know corporate money and geez, what do I do? I don't have enough time and it's got to be spent by a certain date. You you can get projects done. It just it's it's a little more difficult, but just don't be discouraged if that happens. It, it we'll make it happen, or I'm sure anyone you know it, it'll work out. Yeah, that's a great point, Troy. And it's one of those things that we can get creative in that process too. And one of the benefits though, to really understanding the timing and planning aspects of a pavement project or for your whole portfolio is that many of our clients who are bidding six plus months in advance, if they get money available at the end of the year, they already have the design done and are ready to go to execution. Um, so sometimes it takes a couple of yeah. years. I'm glad you brought that up, Troy. It can take a couple of years 
to help get a client really onto the right cycle that works for their own calendar or fiscal year as well. It's not something that we just snap our fingers and we're on that right cycle. Um, so we can definitely shorten those timeframes and get creative with that. Um, so Troy, we do have a couple of questions here. First question is, um, what is the lifespan cost? Uh, what is the lifetime cost of asphalt compared to concrete? Hmm. Boy, that, that's a good question. Uh, concrete is in general more expensive up front. Um, it's definitely more expensive to repair. Um, very few times you can. It's very. It's very unusual to be able to overlay concrete with asphalt, you can't overlay concrete with concrete uh, unless you do like a full section, but you still have cracks that reflect through. Um, we've done some asphalt overlays that were supposed to be temporary to help get a client through over existing concrete. And they, they worked out better than we expected. And we got more life out of the, that pavement than, than we expected or told the client we thought they would get out of it. Um, it all comes down to base. Um, the founder of the pavement division of our company always told me the three most important things are base, base, and base, <laughs> whether it be asphalt or concrete. So if we start with a good base and it's solid and it doesn't yield and it drains and it will never, once a base gets wet, it can go to failure. Um, so we keep water away from it with under drains, uh, under drain systems that we, we, the water away from the base, um, concrete and can last a long time, but pavement can last a long time too. Um, it used to be that we would put concrete in at eight inches thick and we put the asphalt in at three inches thick. Well, concrete is stronger compressively. So it just made sense that the asphalt wouldn't last as long. Well, now we're building perpetual asphalt pavements that are eight, nine inches thick, just like the concrete. But now we can mill that surface off and and, and that's the perpetual pavement I talk about. We can resurface it, make it like new, uh, and that gives it an advantage over the concrete. So I think um, concrete has initial higher costs, has initial repair costs, but I think with the new asphalt uh, methods that we're using, I think asphalt's a better, more cost-effective um, option in the right circumstances. Now, if you've got an area that has a lot of twisting and turning trucks, uh, um, forklifts that are turning and twisting, uh, we had a project that where they built railroad cars, which are extremely heavy, and they had these uh, dollies that would move them around that were extremely heavy. We went with the concrete just because it has a harder face service and surface. And um, although we've never used it on private jobs, I've seen state jobs where they put an asphalt base down and put concrete over it. So you get the benefits of the asphalt underneath and you get a hard surface of concrete over the top. So, um, but I think... If I got pushed in a corner, I would say asphalt uh, in the right circumstance uh, would be more cost effective over the long awesome. run. Awesome. And we can probably, we can um, follow up with Spencer offline to give him, if he's looking for some cost analysis to try to give him some additional costs. So thank you for that. Okay. Um, we have a couple more questions here, Troy. Um, how long in duration can a typical paving project take? I feel like that's kind of a trick question, but what are your thoughts there? Oh, that, that is tricky. Uh, it all depends on size and thickness and the preparation. Um, if you're just milling off the existing asphalt and repaving it, it, asphalt goes very quickly. The milling process is fast if you're not having to do excavation in new stone. Um, boy, it, it just varies from uh, site to site. Um, some projects take a week. Some projects we've got client uh, consultants that are on for the whole summer because they're yeah. huge yards that are built from the bottom up, brand new construction. So I, I it's kind of a trick question. It, it's it's there's too many variables to answer it with any one. Yeah, answer. it does vary for sure. Um, next question has to do with phasing, Troy. So if my facility will need several phases of work to minimize the impact to our operations. Uh, will that change the overall cost of the project? So can you kind of talk about why we put together the phasing plan and how, how that impacts the overall pricing of the project? Yeah, obviously the more phases you have, it will drive your costs up. But if you have that information in the bidding documents so that the contractor knows exactly how it's going to be built, um, 
his prices will be locked in. He can't come back later and say, well, I thought I was going to be able to pave this all at once, which I've seen happen in the past uh, when I was a contractor. And uh, having all that information in the bidding documents is critical to making sure we don't get price creep later uh, or extras or change orders later when the project is built. But generally, the more area we can give the contractor to work on in any phase, it's going to give us better pricing because they get better production. Um, they don't have as much crew time, less mobilizations. So it, it's, it's critical to the overall cost of the project. And I would th say you also want to look at the quality of the contractor and the contractor's qualifications. If you're breaking things into smaller phases, it can sometimes be a highly complex project that you want to make sure you have a more skilled um, and higher level quality contractor. There's a difference between like a driveway contractor and somebody that's laying asphalt in some of these truck marshaling yards too. Yeah, absolutely. If you work with contractors that are used to doing those type of projects, they understand how it's going to be built and what it's going to take uh, to get it done in the initial bidding process. Awesome. Um, Troy, I don't know if you're going to know the answer to this question. And if we don't know the answer, then we will uh, look look into it. Uh, but there's a question about contractor backlog was mentioned earlier. Um, is that still expected to be an issue uh, into 2025? Well, let me look at my crystal ball. <laughs> um, <laughs> right now, it, it's, it, it's an issue. The project I'm on right now they were afraid to let the con the concrete subcontractor finish all the work at one time because they knew if they were going to ask him to come back, they might not get him back for weeks. And then that would delay the paving because obviously you have to have all the curb and gutters in place before you can pave the asphalt. And so, and I've seen it on other projects prior to the one I'm on now that the concrete guys right now are just slammed, at least in these two areas I'm working in. And I, I expect that to continue. I think, uh, you know, if the economy improves, companies are going to spend more money and do more expansions. If the economy doesn't improve, you're going to see a lot more reconstructions, uh, maintenance work. And that's, you know, it seems like that work's always there. So I, I, I would tend to lean toward it's going to stay pretty slammed for the next few years. Yeah, um, I would tend to agree with that. We don't have a crystal ball, but we have seen great success with um, our clients who are bidding their projects the calendar year prior to um, they're some of the first on the schedule, or maybe they're not the first on the schedule, but they get the pick of where they need their project. So if their slow time is June, then they're getting they're getting themselves penciled into June and the contractors working around that. Uh, so definitely some of the, the benefits to being able to get on the contractor schedule um, where it works best for you as the client, but then also um, in the construction season. So that is all the questions that have been submitted. Um, we have one minute left. So if you have another question, let us know. But otherwise, uh, Troy and I just want to thank you for spending an hour of your day with us. Uh, we know everybody is very busy and appreciate you guys taking the time. Uh, if you've got any questions um, offline here, I should have gone to this slide here. Uh, but here is Troy and I's contact information. Please do not hesitate to reach out to either one of us or anybody from the Benchmark team uh, with any questions that you have. Um, have a great rest of your day, and uh, hopefully we'll be in touch with all of you soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.